Mm. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Thinking with Sentio webinar series. I hope you're all doing very well. My name is Zama Zulu. In this morning's uh, presentation, we are going to be discussing this value trade. Is it over or does it still have legs? And to facilitate that particular conversation, I am joined by Olwe Tunoche, who is a portfolio manager at Sentio Capital. If you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A tab at the, at the bottom of your screen, and all the way to all attend to those questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Zama. Um, shout if anybody can't see the screen. I hope that everyone is seeing uh, the presentation properly. Um, as Zama told you again, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the emerging market trade and or the value trade, whether or not... Uh, we should see continued outperformance or not. Um, the way we're going to approach the subject is we're going to look at it from three angles. Uh, we're going to talk about the US monetary policy, how it affects uh, markets uh, and the consequences of it. Then we're going to talk about uh, our expectations that uh, we're looking for out of uh, the emerging market space and, uh, and for, uh, the value style uh, of stocks. And then finally, we're going to talk about our positioning and the positioning of the market um, to exploit uh, the current fundamentals of, of, of the market. So I guess we have to start with uh, understanding monetary policy in order to assess how we got here and how uh, we see the future developing. So if we cross our minds back to 2019, um, US GDP was going at two to 3%. Uh, Chinese GDP was at five to six percent growth, and everything was working just fine up until uh, December 2019, when we started to see uh, the COVID vaccine start to emerge in China, and then ultimately spread to um, the rest of the world. Obviously, the consequences of uh, COVID-19 were severe uh, on economies. I mean, our oil share was down 35 percent. Um, the S&P 500 was down 34 percent and US GDP was slashed uh, by a third as well because of uh, government-mandated government lockdowns and other COVID restrictions. So the response from uh, federal governments globally um, was that they were gonna slash interest rates, they're gonna drive a lot of stimulus uh, or monetary easing uh, into, the, into the economies. And in order to facilitate a rebounding uh, of not only risk assets like our shares that we uh, hold, but also the economies broadly. So what we saw is that uh, the S&P 500 uh, then rebounded up 72%. The JC All Share was up 66% uh, as well during the period. Uh, fast forward a couple of months, coming into 2021, uh, we started to see obviously the consequences of all this monetary easing uh, in, in the economies. We've since seen uh, US inflation peak over 5%. China being the first uh, economy that reopened from COVID uh, had a little bit of a wobbly over the past uh, three months in terms of growth. Uh, doesn't look like their growth expectations are gonna be met. Um, and as a result, they look to be on a path to easing monetary conditions again, um, but that still remains to be seen to what extent um, they'll ease those conditions. And then what happens in 2021, 2022? Um, and I guess that's gonna be the, the meat and potatoes of uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. So just to get everyone to, let's say the same common denominator about uh, US monetary policy, what it is, how it works and why it's needed, Essentially, uh, monetary policy is just the management of uh, money supply in the economy. What it, what it effectively does is it controls the level of growth uh, and also the level of inflation uh, that economies uh, operate under. Typically, the, the US Fed uh, targets an inflation rate of around 2%. And as you've seen uh, in, in the recent past, they've gotten way past that 2% uh, range uh, and anchored over 5%. And we'll speak a little bit more about the consequences of that and uh, any outcomes that uh, surround that. 
Uh, you do need obviously monetary policy because particularly from the Fed because it drives global liquidity conditions. It's the, uh, it's, let's call it the global risk-free rate. And also more locally in the United States, it governs the long-term trends uh, in terms of price escalations in the economy. So you don't get situations of overheated economies and the consequences of hyperinflation and uh, price instability um, that come with that. So if you look on um, the left-hand side, you can see that uh, with the red line, uh, it's, you've got the G3 central banks and the G3 essentially are Japan, the European Central Bank and the US Fed. And you can see that from April, 2020, the amount of assets that were sitting in those three institutions' balance sheets was $15 trillion. Uh, as a result of their response to COVID, um, you can see that that number has escalated significantly and it's now at around $25 trillion. Uh, US dollars. And the effects of all this monetary easing obviously have been uh, twofold. You've seen the S&P 500, which is our proxy for risk assets globally, uh, outperform significantly, as I said earlier on, up 66%. And you can see that uh, Navy Lions performance since last year. Other consequences uh, of the monetary easing, the fiscal stimulus, and also part of the reopening uh, of economies have been what you see on the right hand side here. You can see that economic surprises have moved up four standard deviation uh, events. And essentially what a standard deviation is, is um, it's a measure of volatility, uh, if you will. Um, and what you can see uh, if you cast your eye to 2009, that the last time we had a four standard deviation event, again, was as a consequence of the monetary easing that we experienced in 2009 when we had the global financial crisis. So these economic surprises as well drive the red lines, which are earnings revision ratios. You can see again that you had significant upward trend in terms of earnings revisions uh, ratios globally. And obviously this is on expectation that we're gonna get growth as a result of all the central bank stimulus that uh, we've seen in, we've seen delivered by central banks. So the market now obviously is thinking, well, where to from here, considering that all this printing has occurred and um, what is the next leg for uh, continued upward growth if it is going to be. Other consequences, obviously, of well, monetary stimulus, we touched on China. Um, and you can see that the amount of global commodity demand, again, has spiked up four standard deviation events. And again, the driver behind this is not only the monetary stimulus or the quantitative easing that we've seen, it's also the fiscal stimulus. And essentially, what we've seen globally amongst all the regulators uh, has been that it's a two-pronged approach with, with which they're looking at getting out of COVID. They're going to uh, do a lot of quantitative easing or uh, monetary stimulus, but at the same time, a lot of fiscal stimulus, so a lot of infrastructure projects, uh, bridges, and those sorts of things, similar akin to what we saw in China. And ultimately, what that leads to is a significant amount of demand for uh, commodities. And when you have a tight situation, in, as, as you have in the commodity space where Supply reacts very, very slowly. Demand has already uh, moved upwards. You get a positive upward uh, support on, um, on metals prices or commodity prices, uh, if you will. So you can see on the graph now on the right-hand side that as a result of this, significant uptick uh, in commodity demand. You can see that emerging market uh, earnings expectations have also started to catch up uh, to developed markets expectations. You can see at 2020 at the bottom, there was a significant gap between developed markets and uh, emerging markets earnings expectations. And as a result, obviously, of uh, the monetary stimulus, the fiscal stimulus, 
uh, you can see that uh, emerging markets have closed the gap. Essentially, I mean, emerging markets are typified as uh, economies that are commodity producing. You do get different types of emerging markets. So you do get your growth emerging markets, like your Koreas, your Chinas, and those countries that are a little bit ahead in the evolution of the manufacturing or the value creation space. But in the main emerging markets, Brazil, South Africa, those parts of the world uh, tend to be very, very commodity intensive. And that we think that's what uh, was obviously driving um, these, these up, this upward revision in, in earnings expectations for emerging markets. So the consequences um, of this positive situation, you can see on the left-hand side again, um, emerging markets started to outperform um, developed markets after the COVID crisis. And the reason obviously for this is not only the, the resources uh, super cycle period that we're in, but there would also been a period of about six years, maybe five years rather, of underperformance of emerging markets relative to developed markets. The reason behind that was obviously the America uh, policies, the America first policies that were uh, administered by um, Donald Trump. Um, and that had led to a period of significant or lengthy underperformance of emerging markets. But the amount of fiscal stimulus pumped into the economy um, has obviously provided a bit of growth and has supported uh, emerging market outperformance. On the right hand side, again, after 12 years of underperformance, because value had out underperformed growth for about 12 years since 2009, you can see that. Uh, in the current year, that value actually started to outperform um, growth stocks in the red. And again, obviously the question is, uh, will this continue or, will, or was this a flash in the pan, if you will? So some of the, let's call it the less positive consequences of uh, monetary easing have been uh, the US inflation. We've seen a significant uptick where inflation is over 5% in the USA, uh, almost unprecedented really. Um, and a key driver for this hasn't only been just the amount of uh, money that's been pumped into the system, but it's also the readiness of the economy, economy to facilitate or to cater to the demands of the reopening uh, of, of global economies. We found ourselves uh, as a result of COVID-19, where a lot of uh, original equipment manufacturers like uh, Ford, General Motors shut down their plants because they thought that there's going to be very, very limited sales. And as a result, the entire value chain of cars for, was, had a significant constraint in terms of supply. When economies did open up, and demand did come back in a much more stronger way than everyone had anticipated. There just wasn't enough supply of simple things like cars uh, in the space for semiconductors or microchips. There was an insufficient uh, uh, capacity to supply all the electronics that were being bought. And also we had an issue where labor was actually quite uh, expensive because people were getting stimulus checks and some people were earning more of stimulus checks than they otherwise would uh, from actually working. What this resulted is that they created a significantly tight market. And that tight market obviously meant that there was pop upward pressure in terms of pricing. And as a result, you saw the inflation numbers uh, that have been coming through uh, out of uh, the United States over the past couple of months. Now, the Fed, I mean, well, the surprise in terms of inflation has caught a lot of market participants off guard and has made market participants wary as well as to how long will uh, this level of inflation uh, remain in the system. The Fed has said that the reasons for the inflation were transient, or rather it's an issue of supply and there's a supply adjustment that's required and it should moderate. And we also tend to agree in our view currently is that uh, um, <clears throat> inflation will be transient and you're not likely to see uh, the Fed overreact in the short term with regards to the inflation numbers that we're seeing. So what can we expect uh, out of uh, emerging markets and uh, the value style going forward? Well, 
I mean, we think that uh, a lot of uh, the a lot of catching up needs to be done by emerging markets uh, relative to the rest of the world or the more developed world in terms of the vaccination rates. You can see on the left hand side that uh, USA, Germany, Italy, France were very, very far ahead in terms of the number of people vaccinated per 100. There's 100 people vaccinated per 100 people. Um, and you can see that uh, the rest of the world is sitting at around 40 people per 100 people that have been vaccinated. However, that is starting to accelerate. Obviously, a key issues for the rest of the world were logistics constraints. There were issues around uh, vaccine availability. Uh, and we think that a lot of these issues have been addressed. There is one core risk, though, that we do have to highlight, and that is uh, vaccine reticence. Um, we have started to see not only in the red states in the United States, but also you're starting to see in South Africa, for instance, where there's a bit of vaccine hesitancy. And what this could ultimately lead to is uh, a mutation in this COVID strain, which may be drug resistant, uh, or another strain altogether that we don't know how to cope with. So uh, this is a key risk that uh, we'd like to keep in mind in terms of uh, our expectations for emerging markets going forward. Another key uh, factor to consider when considering any emerging market uh, analysis is obviously China, its consumption of commodities and also its level of, uh, its level of quantitative easing. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side is um, a red graph, which is called total, China total social financing. And essentially all that is, that's the amount of quantitative easing or the cheapness of money uh, in the Chinese economy. You can see that uh, whenever money is cheap, uh, it carries along with it uh, ferrous metals prices. You, see, you can see crossing your, your eyes back to 2009 that there was a spike in uh, quantitative easing in China. And what it does is it drives metals prices because it's a big, uh, it's a big consumer of commodities. You can also see similarly here in 2020 that there was an uptick in terms of total social financing. And when uh, quantitative easing rolled over, you've got this gap now uh, that's emerged between um, commodity prices and, and, and uh, total social financing. Typically, uh, judging by the past, whenever uh, you see a downturn in uh, Chinese stimulus, you're likely also to see a downturn in uh, commodity prices as well. We are seeing and are tracking um, developments in Chinese construction, obviously a big consumer of uh, iron ore and uh, the steel production process. And again, we've seen about 3.9% decline uh, in the amount of uh, square meters in, uh, available for sale in new buildings in China. Again, a harbinger for uh, softer commodity prices. We have also seen in the interim that iron ore prices have moderated from that $220 per ton uh, mark and it actually started to fall and we're currently at $130 a ton. And again, a uh, big driver uh, of that is um, China. So, <sighs> What we expect uh, then from developed markets and emerging markets, we have started to see a little bit of a recovery in uh, the earnings expectations of uh, developed markets. And at the same time, with not overly demanding price multiples, uh, we think that uh, there could be potential opportunities uh, in some developed market spaces, uh, just to bring a bit of a barbell or to hedge a little bit of the risk that uh, may result of holding uh, emerging market stocks. Uh, emerging markets on a sector by sector basis, if you look at the resources uh, sector, you probably think that's likely to have peaked and is probably going to turn over. If you look at the industrials and financials, however, they still appear to be very cheap. Um, and obviously, upward revision in earnings expectations will support uh, positive momentum in terms of um, in terms of their ratings. So Bringing it uh, all back to South Africa now and what we think about uh, South Africa, which is essentially a, a value market and also an emerging market at the same time, you can see that um, uh, our macro risk indicators have declined significantly. Um, and at the very same time, with those declining uh, risk indicators, we've also seen that 
the South African ink or the domestic uh, stocks have started to, uh, to have bottomed and have started to perform well. Um, there are risks, obviously, uh, to this positivity. Um, and the key risk, obviously, is being another strain of COVID, further COVID lockdowns. If we have to see a fourth wave, for instance, in, uh, in, 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 in December, which is traditionally a very big month for retailers, it could curb our earnings expectations uh, for some of these value sectors. The riots, obviously, um, the market has decided to look through uh, these riots because they tend, well, they, I mean, we've seen a couple of instances of these sorts of riots in other parts of the world. I mean, January 6th wasn't too long ago when um, the American rioters tried to take over Congress. We've seen riots in Cuba and, in, and a whole lot of places because people are struggling. But it is a, is, it is a risk should it escalate and become something more than just um, uh, isolated riots, if you will. This, uh, this graph here, again, uh, kind of shows you the divergence between uh, domestic stocks in the gray and resources stocks in the red. These are the earnings expectations for the two sectors. You can see that with resources, there's a very, very high level. There's around four standard deviations above the mean uh, in terms of earnings expectations uh, that have been built into the market. And we think that uh, these prices obviously are, are very, very high and likely to, 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 to turn over. Uh, on the SA Inc. front, you can see that uh, there's continued uh, earnings upgrades from the bottom. Uh, obviously, what uh, this will do is it'll foster or uh, support some of the, the beaten up value stocks in the retailer space and the bank space, for instance. And uh, obviously, this, is, this should continue if we have an economy that's recovering uh, and being reformed from the corruption that we experienced uh, over the past decade or so. So we think that uh, SA Inc. value stocks, domestic stocks are cheap. We think that you should be selective uh, in how you approach the resources stocks because even our worst PGM operator now is uh, producing EBITDA margins in excess of 50%. Now, this is London being our, our worst PGM miner. So basically, these are hypercyclical stocks in a hypercyclical sector. So we think that you should be selling now at the top of the cycle in some of the in select resources stocks and redeploying that money in uh, South African domestic stocks or financials, insurers, and, and that sort of thing. Um, we think that uh, maybe on a relative basis, SA Inc. is likely to uh, outperform Mersey from there. So to summarize, essentially, uh, what our view is globally, uh, we think that uh, the economic uh, reopenings um, that we're seeing as a result of the vaccination rates in, in, in developed worlds are, are going to foster and support a recovery uh, in, in, in the global economy. We are concerned about the Chinese momentum and uh, the, let's call it the less accommodated monetary stance uh, that they're taking and the effect that that will have on, um, on commodity stocks. Uh, we think that the big economic surprises are probably done now, and you're likely to see ex lower returns and probably lower returns out of uh, your value style as well. And again, so we're advocating that you should perhaps have a little bit, you should have value, select value, but you should start introducing quality stocks uh, alongside that to kind of give balance or barbell uh, to that positioning. There are risks, obviously, to the reopening again. We have said that... Uh, vaccine reticency uh, is a key risk. The Fed pulling the trigger on stopping quantitative easing sooner than expected is also another key risk that could catch markets off guard. They have been to, gone to great lengths to identify and to say that um, they will be giving uh, the market until November before they start uh, doing this. So we still like emerging market stocks. Uh, although we think that you should start to introduce some developed market stocks, and similarly, we like some value stocks, and we think you should uh, introduce some quality stocks. On the domestic front, our recovery obviously uh, continues. 
Uh, we still have some political and other risk premium uh, to our pricing. Um, we think, however, the market is willing to look through uh, some of our headwinds that we have, uh, the political dynamics and our other risk premium. We think that in the short term, there's potential for a cyclical upturn in terms of growth, but we are uh, going to caveat that and say that we still have uh, our structural issues in place in South Africa, high unemployment, uh, and a constrained fiscal headroom as well, which could be a long-term uh, drag in terms of growth. So our positioning uh, and the way that the market is positioned, you can see on uh, the left-hand side at the top here that the market appears, fund managers globally are reducing their exposure to commodities, to emerging markets uh, and to materials. Let's call it, they're taking a little bit uh, of risk off the table, and they're introducing quality stocks like your healthcare, your insurers, and utilities, uh, just to just to balance off uh, that risk uh, that you get in, in in the tail end of this value run. You can also see at the bottom um, a long commodity exposure. The change between July and August, you can see that that's reduced. Globally, you can see that people are also buying less Bitcoin and they are increasing the level of treasuries um, in their portfolios. Again, just uh, some of the growth concerns that are developing in the rest of the world that uh, we probably peaked uh, in, terms of, in terms of growth and people are trying to diversify away from value, which is very, very dependent on, the, on, on growth fundamentals. So <clears throat> in summary, uh, we think that uh, SA Inc. is still trading at a discount, obviously. There are positive upward uh, earnings expectations, which should be good, which should support uh, further re-rating uh, in those stocks. We do obviously have our long-term concerns about South Africa, which still are in place. Uh, but we think in the short term, short to medium term, uh, there is an opportunity uh, to profit off uh, our cyclical upswing and growth. Resources earnings probably elevated now, and uh, we think that even though uh, the macro backdrop is still quite supportive, we think that one should be discerning in the RISI space uh, in terms of what they choose. Maybe it's appropriate to be reducing the bulk commodity producers and the diversifiers and keeping the PGM uh, stocks and deploying some of that money into quality stocks like your clicks, uh, like your BTI and so forth, and your Bit Bit Bitcoin. Uh, and also some uh, SA Inc. Um, stocks as well. Uh, we do think that emerging market valuations are cheap. Um, uh, we are obviously keeping a keen eye on uh, the growth concerns and the slowing earnings expectations um, coming out of the emerging markets. So uh, again, what we're advocating for is for balance in portfolios, have emerging market exposure for a little bit more of that growth, but recycle where you can where you've generated profits into some developed market quality assets as well uh, as a barbell. Our positioning currently um, is, these are our 10, top 10 holdings. You can see that uh, at the top of our biggest holding is Deutsche Post. And this is uh, one of the ways in which we're playing on the developed market, um, the developed market trade. Uh, this, these businesses, Deutsche Post, um, UPS, FedEx, uh, and these delivery businesses are almost in a similar spot to the resources stocks in that they are in a bit of a super cycle of sorts. What's happening obviously uh, globally is you've seen this transition in retail and how people are consuming, people are no longer going to the shops, uh, people are consuming a lot more online retail. But all those purchases need to be fulfilled and there's a finite supply of fulfillment capabilities uh, for this transition. This is where Deutsche Post and UPS and these guys get set to profit because um, creating the footprint of their operations, again, is extremely uh, expensive and prohibitive. And currently, the surge in demand that we're seeing in online retail is also ultimately becoming a surge in demand for their services. Um, to deliver to fulfill the last mile. So um, we think that pricing is going to be good in terms of these delivery businesses and volumes are going to be good. So they're actually also in a little bit of a uh, 
super cycle similar to resi stocks. We again said that uh, it's uh, probably prudent to be taking um, profits from your bulk diversified. We used to have Anglo-American here, which we've reduced. We have been also cutting a little bit, taking a little bit of profits out of uh, the PGM space because we had made a lot of money there and deploying it uh, in stocks like APSA Group uh, and also Hoya and Johnson & Johnson, for instance. NASPERS is, is uh, an overweight for us currently. Uh, most of the year we've been underweight um, as a result of us not agreeing um, with the share swap transaction. Essentially, we don't think that uh, the share swap transaction is going to unlock the discount. In fact, it's probably just going to make the discount a little bit more uh, stubborn or structural. Um, but I mean, the stock has fallen. Uh, Oof, it's almost halved, I think. And similarly, you've seen Tencent also halved as well over the past year. So everything has a price, I guess. Um, I mean, the discount now shot out to about 90% in NASPES. And eventually, in the long term, we think that uh, valuations have to matter at some point. So uh, that's the, the reasoning behind our NASPES position. Um, I'm cognizant of the amount of time. I've already gone four minutes over um my allotted time so uh if anyone wants to speak about uh any other stocks i'm happy to address uh, those questions uh, uh in the upcoming slide um but if there's nothing else then uh, we can uh, talk about other questions as well all right thank you very much all um maybe just uh two questions at the moment uh, um just waiting to see if there are any others uh, from the members of the audience. Um, you spoke about applying a barbell approach um, in terms of um, balancing the value uh, exposure with some of the momentum through the resources at play. What about hedging? Um, is that something that Sentio um, is looking at uh, incorporating um, in, the, in the portfolios at this stage? So we do, we, we do hedge opportunistically. Um, we do hedge it opportunistically. We have hedged our RAND exposure in this portfolio uh, using the zero cost colors. Uh, our cap is at around 1650 and I think uh, the put is at 14 rand 50. We think uh, there's some opportunities there. Uh, capping the market or hedging the market, uh, we haven't uh, done anything that uh, is significantly out of the ordinary though, um, in terms of uh, derivative structures or um, anything else currently. All right, um, and then just in terms of a list of properties specifically, so you showed us the top 10 holdings um, in the equity portfolio. Um, but obviously we didn't see any uh, list of property stocks. In general, what is Centro's stance on that as a class? Um, it has had quite a decent rally year to date um, after a shocking two odd years. Uh, what, what are Centro's views on listed property at the moment? Yeah, we're not keeping, um, we've got a neutralish positioning on uh, property. We are not, uh, we, yeah, we're not really too excited right now uh, about uh, about property. I mean, we hold uh, the blue chips, if you will. I think we hold Growth Point, uh, Resilient, and um, uh, Nepi, for instance. So um, yeah, our, our, our positioning, um, we're not banging the drum yet saying that you know it's time for property yet. Obviously, there's still a lot of uh, difficulty that needs to be what needs to rush through that system, particularly with office and you know the, the work from home dynamic that we're seeing and. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we're not saying that, uh, we're not saying that we're not overly optimistic, neither we're saying we're overly pessimistic, obviously, um, on, on property right now. It's about a neutralish uh, position. All right. And then just another stock that's always of interest to people, Apple. Um, so, you know, just looking at technology stocks globally in general, um, how well they've continued to perform. Yes, there was a bit of a slight dip um, during the, the, value, um, the, the, the value rally um, from the end of 2020. Um, is Apple a stock that you hold um, in your portfolios? 
Yeah, Apple is a stock that we like. Um, I mean, it's a very, very good business. High ROEs, still significant levels of growth um, that uh, that are achieved for a, a very, 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 very large business. Um, again, they came out with a set of numbers, again, which were encouraging quite recently. Um, you saw that uh, the new designs of iPads are performing well. You continue to see that uh, the AirPods are, I think, around $20 billion in terms of revenue now. It's massive. Uh, and we continue to see uh, the lifestyle engagement with the product as well is quite healthy. So um, <clears throat> it's not our biggest position currently because we've taken profits out of Apple, um, but it is a stock that opportunistically, when it does dip, we'll come in and we'll buy and we'll uh, have a chunky uh, positioning and you know we, we're active uh, in, in the stock, if you will. All right, no, thank you. Um, there are no further questions. Do you mind just maybe going on to the next slide? I just want to highlight um, the availability of the Centio uh, portfolios. Thank you. So to all of you on this call, um, this is just a summary of where, which list platforms the Centio portfolios are available. Just for you to note, one key change of late um, is the availability of the Sharia funds, the two uh, Sharia funds being made available on the Allen Gray platform, as well as on Easy Equities. So if you can just please bear that in mind if you do um, place Sharia uh, specific business for your clients. Well, that uh, uh, concludes this, sessions, um, this session for today. Thank you so much to all of you for uh, dialing in and uh, joining us. I do trust that you found um, this session informative and worthwhile. If you do have any uh, further questions, uh, please feel free um, to reach out um, to us. But um, yeah, we wish you a, a, a good day further. And thanks again. We will be in touch closer to the end of the year with the final uh, episode uh, for 2021. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Goodbye.